It's saying that I don't have permission. I think I need to be logged into a webinar specific account and not my like basic account. Okay, you've got two options. You can um, get out and come back in with the AWS information that I sent you. Okay. <coughs> sure, I can do that. Let me make you the host. event uh, regarding jobs restoration and resilience the nexus of conservation and jobs in Arizona so right off the bat here I would like to remind a few folks uh, regarding etiquette around zoom and uh, Facebook events and us through zoom you'll be on mute throughout the webinar if you have questions and we, we certainly urge you to share your questions you can do that via the chat box on zoom if you're joining us through Facebook live, please drop those questions into the chat. Um, our staff will be monitoring those questions and consolidating them for our panelists. And unfortunately, we might not have time to get to everyone's questions, but we'll certainly do our best. So with that, I'm gonna go through and I'm gonna introduce our, our partners, uh, panelists and guests uh, in the order that, that you'll be seeing them throughout this event. So first off, we're gonna have uh, Scott Garland. He is our executive director of the Arizona Wildlife Federation. After we hear from Scott, we'll be moving on to Nikki Julian. She's a coordinator for Go AZ, that's Get Outdoors Arizona Business Coalition. Then we will have Camilla Simon. Camilla is the executive director of ECHO, Hispanics Enjoying Camping, Hunting, and the Outdoors. Then we're going to have David Dreher, Drehar, forgive me if I'm, I hope I'm saying that right. David is the senior manager of public lands for the National Wildlife Federation. And David's gonna be providing us a summary of the uh, jobs restoration and resilience for the 21st century report that was recently released by the National Wildlife Federation. Then, unfortunately, uh, Arizona Senator Mark Kelly couldn't be with us today, but he was gracious enough to provide us with a recorded message that we'll be hearing from. And finally, we will be joined by U.S. Representative Tom O'Halloran um, and the Congressman will give us a, a, a talk and follow up by, by answering all the questions. So that's, that's a short uh, summary of our event. And with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Scott Garland and Scott's gonna tell us a bit about the Arizona Wildlife Federation. Great, thanks, Michael. I'm Scott Garland. I'm the executive director of the Arizona Wildlife Federation. Uh, the Arizona Wildlife Federation or AWF is Arizona's oldest conservation organization. We were founded in 1923, just four years after Grand Canyon National Park was established. Um, and our membership consists of what I would describe as a healthy mix of all types of outdoor recreation lovers. So probably over half are hunters and anglers or what we call consumptive oftentimes. And then a little bit less than half are non-consumptive wildlife watchers, hikers, campers, mountain bikers, everything else you can think of enjoying in the outdoors. Um, our mission is to inspire Arizonans to value and conserve wildlife and outdoor places. And we kind of divide our work into three primary focus areas. First is education, second is on the ground projects, and third is advocacy. With education, we work with younger children um, to get them outdoors with nature play um, through our ECHO program or Early Childhood Outdoors program. Uh, with middle schoolers and kids that are a little bit older, we work to build lifelong conservation values with them through our Eco Schools program. And then we also have a program geared towards adult women where we help individuals get comfortable with a wide variety of outdoor experiences through what we call our Becoming an Outdoors Woman or BOW program. Uh, the second focus area for AWF is our on the ground project work, which is typically done with AWF volunteers. We partner with other conservation and sportsman groups on habitat restoration projects that include things like fence removal, riparian restoration, or water for wildlife projects. Our third focus area, which is kind of what we're doing today, is uh, about advocacy. 
And we try to do a mix of education and influencing of elected officials in some cases. Um, but we try to share a balanced and science-based perspective on proposed policies and legislation that affects Arizona's outdoors. So I think everyone on this call probably knows, or you wouldn't be on this call, that you know we desperately need public leaders who understand the value of outdoor places and outdoor recreation and how important those are to our quality of life and our economy. Um, we we're fortunate today to have two guests, Congressman O'Halloran and Senator Kelly, Kelly who we will hear, hear from. As Michael said, Senator Kelly's got a tape message, but these are two Arizona leaders as we get around and talk to people um, who certainly get it when it comes to the importance of conservation and outdoor recreation related jobs in Arizona. So if you want more information about the Arizona Wildlife Federation, we'll post a link in the chat how to get that information. And uh, we're happy to be here today and certainly happy to host this event. Thanks, Michael. All right, thank you, Scott, I appreciate that. Um, next, let's go to uh, Camilla. Camilla Simon with the uh, Hispanics enjoying camping, hunting, and the outdoors. It's all yours, Camilla. Thanks, Michael, and thanks, Scott. Um, yes, I'm Camilla Simon. I'm the executive director of Hispanics enjoying camping, hunting, and the outdoors. Uh, we are a group that elevates Hispanic leaders' voices and increases the visibility of Hispanics in public lands, policymaking, and advocacy. We had our beginnings in 2013 with the vision of building a platform to bring culture, carencia, which is a love for the land and uh, conservation of our shared natural resources to local state and national public land conservation policy and advocacy efforts. Uh, you know, poll after poll demonstrates the fact that Hispanics are more consistent supporters of protecting the environment than non-Hispanics. And in fact, 92% of Hispanics believe, quote, we have a moral responsibility to protect our public lands, end quote. And 57% of Hispanics use public lands at least monthly. And despite these clear connections to our public lands and waters, Hispanic voices have not been consistently part of decision-making processes. Hispanic communities continue to feel the brunt of environmental injustice and Hispanic families still face barriers to accessing and enjoying the outdoors. So ECHO has grown to be active in five states. We're in Arizona, New Mexico, Colorado, Utah, and Nevada. We're bringing Hispanic perspectives and stories to federal level um, conservation policy conversations. And in doing so, we are helping to close the gap between underrepresentation when it comes to decision making and overrepresentation when it comes to impact from environmental harms. And some of the policy issues that ECHO has been working on are protection of the Grand Canyon watershed from uranium mining. Um, we've been working to advocate, and we did advocate for permanent authorization and full funding for the Land and Water Conservation Fund. Um, which is a fund that has helped nearly every county in the US since its, its inception over 50 years ago. And we've been ensuring that local communities are providing input into national policy, like the infrastructure policy conversations that are happening right now that aim to create jobs that both help our country recover from the pandemic and economic crisis while restoring our public lands through jobs programs that address critical needs like the remediation of thousands of abandoned oil and gas wells and mines, the restoration of wild, wildlife migration pathways and construction of wildlife crossing. Um, also critical to these infrastructure policy conversations are the promotion of partnerships with people who are closest to the land, such as farmers and ranchers who play a key role in using climate-friendly agricultural practices and providing other important ecosystem benefits on their land. And we need to recognize that. Um, you know, I'm sure we'll get into some more of these um, issues during this uh, event. And we're really proud to be here today um, co-hosting this event with our partners at Arizona Wildlife Federation and Go Arizona. And we really look forward to continuing this conversation. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Camilla. Appreciate that. All right, next up we have Nikki Julian. Um, Nikki is a coordinator for Get Outdoors Arizona. She's gonna tell us a bit about that. It's all yours, Nikki. Hi, thank you, Michael. Make sure I'm not... Um... <laughs> Sorry. 
you're coming through loud and clear to us, Nikki. Good. I have a I have an echo on my end, so that's I'm trying to fix that. Okay, can you still hear me? Yeah, you sound great. Awesome. Thank you. Um, Get Outdoors Arizona is a, a coalition of Arizona businesses whose success depends on their outdoor recreation in our state. And uh, they recognize the important link linkage between strong conservation policies and vibrant economic opportunities. We currently have about five, 55 businesses in the coalition and they range from um, outdoor recreation retail shops, uh, outdoor gear manufacturers, tourism, um, lodging and businesses, breweries, hunting and uh, angling outfitters, uh, native landscape designers, business services, and they're from all over the state. So we've got quite a range of people, it's wonderful. Uh, the coalition we started about a year ago uh, as part of our work with Arizona Wildlife Federation and uh, what we realized with advocacy work was that um, the business voice was uh, a critical driver of Arizona's economy, uh, but the outdoor recreation voice was largely, largely missing from um, conservation discussions in our state. So um, Get Outdoors was established to educate members on policy and legislation that might affect their businesses. Um, and we use it to help them promote their outdoor businesses. So it's kind of a, it's kind of kind of two way, I suppose. Yeah. Um, we do believe that uh, Arizona's outdoor recreation businesses leaders they hold the key to conservation success in the future. They recognize the value of the asset we have in Arizona with all our public lands, uh, and they are pragmatic about how we should go about taking care of that asset. Um, so if any of you joining us today are Arizona businesses uh, who haven't joined us yet, we're going to be putting a link in the chat uh, for how to join and hopefully you'll join us uh, in our efforts. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you for that, Nikki. Uh, those, those businesses are such an important voice for, for uh, the outdoor recreation economy here in Arizona. Very important advocates. Um, next up, we have David Drehar. Uh, and David, please correct me if, I, if I'm messing up that last name, but David is a senior manager of public lands for the National Wildlife Federation, and he's going to be uh, providing us with a summary of a recent report released by the National Wildlife Federation on jobs, restoration, and resilience for the 21st century. Thank you for being with us, David. It's all yours. Thank you. Uh, very close, Dreher. Um, Dreher. Thank you, sir. <laughs> but you're, close, you're closer than most, so thank you. Thanks everyone. I'm going to, I don't know that I can uh, share a screen. So I'm going to put the restoration and resilience document into the chat uh, so that folks can open that up and take a look. <clears throat> um, and let's see. David, do you want us to share it? Uh, sure. Uh, if folks want to uh, look through it, it may be easier if people just look do it on their own. Okay. Well. Yeah, through the link. All right. Thank you. So this restoration and resilience uh, and jobs for the 21st century really came out of conversations that we had last spring when the oil industry collapsed and oil prices went negative to, to the point that traders on Wall Street were faced with the prospect of literally having to go into West Texas and picking up their oil shipment because they couldn't sell um, their spot market shares. So we said, there's gonna be a bunch of bankruptcies and folks are gonna walk away from oil and gas wells great opportunity to, to take out some of those oil and gas wells and fields, reconnect some wildlife habitat, um, reduce methane emissions into the air and put a bunch of people to work um, in places that are, are going to hurt because of the pandemic and the collapse in the market. Um, we started to look bigger than just reclaiming oil and gas wells in Wyoming. Uh, for example, 
and said, what's the intersection of what we can do that has um, bipartisan appeal and has some climate benefits? So we started to look at all of our program areas um, and came up with something that uh, totals $200 billion, which is a massive number. But in context of what we're talking about now of an infrastructure bill, a jobs proposal coming from the administration of around $2 trillion, it's 5% for conservation and 5% for conservation that has positive climate benefits and puts people to work. So um, if you look at that first number, $43 billion for uh, forestry generally, um, we tend to think of that as watershed health, um, which includes hazardous fuel reduction, taking out roads and culverts, reconnecting aquatic systems, reconnecting habitat, defragmenting habitat. Um, and as these numbers can sometimes look very general, they can also look very specific. Um, we, we know through working with the Forest Service, for example, how much they estimate that they need over the next decade uh, to get ahead of the fuel reduction problem and their forest health issues. Um, they just took a look at that last summer in response to all the wildfires in Oregon and California. California now has a, a year round fire season, essentially. Um, so these, all of these numbers are, are good estimates, also informed by a lot of data and working with EPA and the Forest Service and BLM and others. Um, so there, there's some, there's some real uh, ground truthing behind them, um, even though there are estimate, uh, they are estimates. So anyway, uh, forest watershed health, um, we took a look at abandoned wells and uh, abandoned mines. Uh, a lot of bipartisan support for cleaning up old oil and gas wells. Um, you know, Interstate Oil and Gas Commission estimates that there's 57,000 uh, uh, identified wells. EPA estimates that there are up to 2 million uh, that are out there that leak into groundwater, leak methane into the air. Uh, a lot of bipartisan support for taking care of this problem. Um, it gets a little tricky when you start talking about billions of dollars uh, and the appetite for, for spending such numbers, uh, but no one disagrees on uh, that the problem exists and what the, what the solution is. So we're, we're halfway there already. Um, there's also things that are not as relevant uh, to Arizona, such as um, coastal resiliency, flood mitigation, um, all of that natural infrastructure that reduces risks from hurricanes, uh, other things like that. Um, but other, other items are very relevant. Um, working with farmers and ranchers to bump up conservation programs that we normally associate with uh, farm bill programs, um, eradicating cheatgrass, it's a big fire issue. It's a big habitat issue when you're talking about sage grouse habitat, also in the Southwest and non sage grouse areas. Um, that grassland restoration, really important, puts a lot of people to work on the ground. Uh, there's also a CCC component to this, um, getting people out working on the ground through investing in CCC uh, is really important. There's a bunch of stuff in here that they're not equipped to do, however. Um, they don't normally fire up a D8 cat and rip a road and, and take out culverts or replace culverts. Um, so there's a lot of CCC um, types of, of activities that we envision in this spending, but um, certainly not everything. Um, capping oil and gas wells, for example, uh, you, you need those, those oil field roughnecks uh, doing a lot of that work. So... I'm gonna stop there. I feel like I've been talking for too long 
and just ask if there are questions. One thing that always comes up that I'll touch on uh, is do you envision agency <clears throat> capacity to be part of this? Absolutely. Uh, it's not something that we necessarily highlight because um, there's sensitivity around creating a whole new government workforce. Um, but if the Forest Service is going to get projects implemented on the ground, they need a lot more bodies to do the planning and biologists to do the analysis, field work. Um, so there's a, a pretty heavy component in reestablishing agency capacity across the board to do a lot of this work. Uh, but I will, I will leave it there and just see if there are questions. All right, David, thank you David, so much. David, do you want to David, do you want to describe a little bit about what NWF plans to do with this report? You know, like how is it being socialized and what you're doing in, in a moment we're going to hear from a couple of Arizona legislators, but you know, what's the plan that NWF's got? How are you going to use this report? So, great question. Uh, it's been sent to relevant committees and members of Congress uh, on the Hill, we have, we have identified individual members who can be champions for different pieces of this. For example, Senator Cassidy in Louisiana is obviously interested in the coastal resiliency stuff. Um, to, I believe tomorrow, uh, Senator Bennett from Colorado is going to introduce a $60 billion watershed restoration bill um, that was actually name checked in uh, in Biden's plan that was released last week. Um, <clears throat> Senator Wyden has a CCC bill that includes a lot of forest restoration as well. Um, so individual, and there's a lot of bipartisan support around uh, abandoned oil and gas wells. Um, Senators Lujan and uh, Kramer from North Dakota uh, just introduced a bill on Monday. Uh, around that issue. So we're taking these individual pieces and getting them introduced as legislation. Uh, we're working on a grasslands bill modeled after the, the National Wetlands Conservation Program, North American Wetlands Conservation. Um, so we're taking individual, individual pieces, getting it introduced as legislation, creating champions behind those pieces to be advocates for making sure that these things are included in whatever ends up happening in Congress on uh, some types of job stimulus bill that infrastructure package um, that they're working on right now and hope to pass by the fall. Thanks. So also, are you focused only at the federal level or are you doing anything at the state level? For example, our Arizona Governor Ducey it's been pushing for a healthy forest initiative, which is there's a few different pieces of state legislation that kind of are along the lines of your section in there on uh, forest management. Uh, are you focused only on federal activity or are you, and you're hoping it's gonna trickle down or what's the plan between federal and state? So there's definitely a nexus and I'll just use abandoned oil and gas wells as a good example. Um, legislation lays out six and a half billion dollars, 400 million of that goes to federal lands. The rest of it goes to state, private and tribal because that's where the real issues lie um, with abandoned oil and gas wells, most of it state and private land. So those, those monies are going to be granted to the states to carry out that work. Um, same thing, uh, Senator Bennett's forest restoration bill establishes a grant program to deliver funds to um, qualified entities, which could be local counties, collaborative groups, state agencies. Uh, so while at, at a legislative level, we haven't talked about working with the states or within the states, but the states and local entities are going to be responsible for um, delivering the boots on the ground and the dollars that we envision with a lot of this restoration and resilience work. 
Awesome. Thank you, David. Um, as a reminder to everyone, any questions that you have, please put those in the chat and uh, and we'll follow up in our Q&A after, after we hear the rest of our speakers. Um, now we're going to move on to a, a brief recorded message from Senator Kelly, who couldn't be with us today. So if we could go ahead and play that. Hello, everybody. This is Senator Mark Kelly. Thank you for attending today's virtual event hosted by the Arizona Wildlife Federation. Sorry I couldn't be there to join you today, but I wanted to express my support for your efforts to promote conservation and outdoor recreation in Arizona. First, I'd like to extend a warm welcome to members of the Get Outdoors Arizona Coalition and to your partners at Hispanics Enjoying Hiking, Becoming an Outdoors Woman, and camping in the outdoors. And thank you for your advocacy for keeping our public lands, rivers, and lakes clean for the enjoyment of all Arizonans. As you know, the outdoor recreation economy supports hundreds of thousands of jobs and generates over $10.6 billion in Arizona annually. Our state's unique climate offers Arizonans and tourists from around the world, ways to enjoy nature that can't be found anywhere else. But prolonged drought brought on by climate change is threatening our forests and waterways. Fire and diminishing water supplies are impacting fish and wildlife habitats on levels we've never seen before. As your Senator, I'm committed to supporting bipartisan solutions in Congress to address climate change by growing renewable energy production and reducing carbon emissions. And I look forward to working with you to ensure that wildlife conservation remains a focus of my work in Washington. Thank you for the invitation and enjoy today's event. All right, thank you to the Senator for that recorded message. That is appreciated. Um, now we are very fortunate to have US Representative Tom O'Halloran with us. Um, Congressman, the floor is yours, sir. Well, I, I want to thank the Arizona Wildlife uh, Federation for uh, this opportunity and for all you've done uh, in your in the uh, number of years uh, to address the area of wildlife protection, uh, uh, management, appropriate management of our forest, and the future uh, of how we're going to address some of the issues. Uh, to make those forests a better place uh, to enjoy recreationally uh, and to make sure that wildlife is protected. I um, have been involved with uh, uh, forestry issues for a long time in Arizona uh, as a co-chair of the uh, Arizona's uh, Governor Napolitano's Arizona's uh, Forest Health Committee and made recommendations in the past. It's more critical today than ever uh, that we look into the future and identify clearly the appropriate management alternatives that leads us to being able to address the uh, ongoing needs of our forest. Uh, we have a number of uh, areas that we're trying to address uh, at Forfry, which is the uh, uh, stewardship project for uh, the four different uh, forests in, in Northern Arizona. Uh, it's one of those areas where we've worked hard in to address uh, and help create, in fact, and we are still undergoing uh, our uh, process of trying to find uh, funding to get it done in an appropriate way and to get uh, the request for proposal contracts finished uh, by June so we can get to work on those issues and others. Biomass plants are, are, are uh, imperative that we address those as long as they're clean energy. Uh, the ability to manage our forest uh, in a continuous process. Uh, it's one thing to just put a little bit of money forward and say, I, I, I did this. Uh, that's not the intent. Uh, the intent has to be to find ways to address this appropriately. One of those ways is to identify the true cost uh, to the, when a forest fire occurs. It's not just the fighting of the fire. It's not just the planting of, of, of vegetation after a fire. It's all the elements that go into that fire, the loss of habitat, 
uh, the loss of wildlife, the, uh, the impact on water uh, and streams and uh, turbidity within the streams. Uh, the idea that if it went into communities, uh, the impact of those communities by whether it's loss of life or loss of buildings uh, or the entire uh, economic development process of a town as we've seen in California. All these are cost of forest fires and all these have to be brought to the forefront so the American people can feel uh, that we know the true cost and why this is such an important issue to be able to address both fire suppression and management. And uh, I, I, don't, I don't feel we're right where we need to be right now with funding. So I'm committed to try to get additional funding. Uh, but most of all, uh, we have to understand the, uh, the connection uh, between uh, manage managing our forests correctly, uh, the impact to recreationalists, uh, the impact to uh, our tourism and, and uh, the impact to uh, an asset as an asset of the American people and our care that needs to go forward. So once again, I want to thank you for all you've done and appreciate the opportunity to talk to you today. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Congressman. We appreciate you being here. And if you don't mind sticking around for the Q&A, we'd appreciate that as well. Um, with that, I'm gonna pass it back to Camilla and Camilla will be, will be vetting our questions and, and getting them to the Congressman and our panelists. I'll try to get back to you. I have another meeting I'm going on right now. No problem, sir. Thank you very much for your thank time. You. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, fantastic. Thank you, Congressman O'Halloran. Um, we have a bunch of questions that have come in. And, and again, um, there is a Q&A uh, button on your Zoom screen where you can put your questions and we'll be collecting those. Um, if you're on Facebook, you can put them in the comment section and we'll try to grab those too. Um, so our first question is from um, an AWF member, Bob asks, um, will this report or the American Jobs Act provide local economic opportunities for forest thinning and the Four Fry project? And I guess I would have asked that to the Congressman because he mentioned four fry directly. Um, yeah, I can, I can try to answer that as well. <laughs> but does somebody at AWF want to try to answer that? Thank you, Camilla. Scott, you're welcome to jump in if you like. If not, Camilla, it's all yours. Go for it, Camilla, and then I'll see if I can add color commentary. Yeah, sure. You know, I think. So I, I think the answer, the short answer is yes. Um, I, you know, we we know that there's that the infrastructure package, whatever it may be, there's a bunch of different pieces of legislation coming through that would fund um, different partnership programs um, that would help, um, you know, small logging businesses to do the thin diameter logging as a solution for, um, you know, forest restoration and, and making sure that. Um, our, our forests are, and the watersheds that the forests um, com are comprised of um, are, are healthy. So the, I think the short answer is yes. Um, it's just a matter of which of the pieces of legislation that are moving um, as part of the larger infrastructure package um, it will be in. I believe that Colorado Senator Bennett is gonna be introducing a, a piece of legislation um, that, that does cover this type of forest restoration um, so um, we should be on the lookout for that um, when that comes out. Yeah, I would just add to that, and sorry, I'm not able to turn on my video. It's saying that the host has turned it off, but anyway, um, I would say that both the report, the whole purpose of the NWF report was to, uh, oh, they're now querying me, um, was to talk about the nexus between conservation, restoration, and jobs. So that certainly has the focus on jobs in terms of what NWF is, is advocating. Uh, every time that we've talked to Congressman O'Halloran, his first question is, you know, how is this gonna impact um, the Arizona economy and jobs in the Arizona economy, whether you're talking about the closure of the Navajo generating station or anything else. So I know that he's got that um, in the forefront of his mind. 
and all the legislation that I've seen, even at the state level, um, the bill, for example, on forest thinning that provided some tax incentives, all of that is also focused on jobs. So I think you're right, Camilla, I think the short answer to it is, yes, we certainly expect these, uh, these policies and this legislative work to result in jobs for Arizonans and specifically for Fort Fry. Great. Thanks, Pat. Okay, um, we have another question here. Under state, private, and tribal forestry cooperative management, what work has been done with tribal entities, tribal lands? Yeah, I, I, I can't, I don't know that one. I can't answer that one for the Congressman. Um, I don't know if there's anybody else on the line that that is willing to take a shot at it. Otherwise, maybe what we can do for some of these is we can get a response back from the Congressman's office, um, or in the case of if it's a question for the NWF uh, report, we can kind of publish it back out to the list as a QA. and a But I mean, feel free, I don't mean to cut us off. I just feel like we've got our two experts that were here that are no longer here to answer the question, so. Yeah, unfortunately, uh, you know, uh, David with with NWF and the congressman obviously have very busy schedules, and and they both had to jump off. Those questions uh, that are more directed to them, we can try to get those to them, get answers to them as well. If anyone has any questions they, uh, regarding uh, ECHO, Arizona Wildlife Federations, are the Get Outdoors Arizona Coalition, we are absolutely able and willing to answer those. Great. Well, I'm kind of combing through some of these two. There's, there seems to be, there's a couple of questions about the Grand Canyon and how that may factor in to um, the, this, um, you know, jobs uh, package. And I'll just, I'll just say, you know, I think, yes, of course, the Grand Canyon is this incredible economic driver for Arizona. I think um, in the most recent review of, of the economic impact there, that economy supported 12,000 jobs. And so, um, you know, I think um, with the uranium mining that has gone on around the Grand Canyon already, there is a huge opportunity for remediation of those mines through this infrastructure package that would help um, improve, the, you know, our, our precious Grand Canyon. Um, so I think the answer to that is definitely um, that there's something in, in this package, in this, in this set of bills for Arizona's Grand Canyon and other public lands. Um, and then there's another question. Um, uh, ECHO member Mark Cardenas says, President Biden's 30 by 30 initiative is ambitious and inspiring, but what counts as part of the 30% conserved? And how can we ensure that diverse stakeholders, including tribes, private landowners and ranchers are included in the con conversations to meet 30 by 30s goals? Yeah, um, that is uh, a good question because, you know, I think similar to what's happening with this, um, with, with this recovery and resiliency jobs infrastructure package, the 30 by 30 initiative is also uh, at the stage where people need to be providing input and that's what our organizations, that's what ECHO, Arizona Wildlife Federation, that's what we do is we, we want to connect our members with those opportunities to have your voices heard. Um, and we definitely want to make sure that, that all stakeholders um, are included in those conversations to help define what, what meets those goals. So um, we will continue to bring you more information about that as, as that develops, so stay tuned. Yeah, I think to tack on to a couple of comments there, Camilla, um, on the 30 by 30, for sure, the devil's in the details. Um, and Congressman O'Halloran recognizes that when we've had conversations with him. There's also a lot of different levels of 30 by 30. You can think of it as big projects, you know, at a federal level. Um, but you can also think of it as access for, you know, urban kids to get out and get to parks. So all of those things can be included in 30 by 30. And Camilla, I think you're absolutely right. What we're trying to do, Arizona Wildlife Federation, is trying to make sure that all perspectives are, are heard. And it's not, this doesn't become a, you know, 
identify, lock up, and throw away the key kind of protectionist um, policy for 30 by 30. So we want to make sure that it's about access and whether that access is for, you know, urban kids, like I said, in local parks or whether it's for hunting and fishing. Um, that's kind of where our focus has been. Um, going back to the Grand Canyon for just a second, I think, you know, one of the things with the Grand Canyon Protection Act that we have to think about relative to jobs is part of this is insurance against job loss. So if you think about all those jobs and the huge economic driver that the Grand Canyon is to our state, if we would have something like, you know, God forbid, some kind of uh, toxic issue at the Grand Canyon because of uranium mining or leaking into water or anything like that, um, that would have a tremendous impact on the outdoor recreation industry of Northern Arizona. And that industry, you know, and the jobs that that supports is, you know, a, magnet, a couple orders of magnitude larger than the jobs that are provided by uranium mining in, in Northern Arizona. So it's a little bit of a balance of outdoor recreation jobs and the risk of potentially impacting those jobs versus uh, mining jobs and the protection of the environment. Okay, Camilla, if we have any more questions that, that are more directly related to the work that our organizations do, we can go ahead and fire off on those. Um, and if not, uh, just let me know and then we can we can give our thank yous and, and say our goodbyes and, and get back and answer these questions, uh, maybe uh, via our email or website. Okay. Um, yes, I'm getting a thank you, uh, Bianca, just uh, highlighted this message said maybe Scott might be able to speak about this. So Somebody wrote there was a big public announcement of an infrastructure package which included clean energy infrastructure by the Biden administration. They say, I also understand there's pending legislation which includes investments in clean energy manufacturing and industrial facilities with a carve out for use in coal mine communities that have been shut down. Please share your insight on the timeline and prospects for considering such bills. Well, I wish I could have a better answer, but I think I'm going to have to say thanks for the question. We'll get back to you because I don't know the timing on it. Um, I do know that if Congressman O'Halloran was still here, he'd say one of the things that he's working really hard on in northern Arizona is to find opportunities for renewables and job replacements, again, for that uh, Navo generating station that was shut down just the year or so ago. But unfortunately, I don't have any more information than that. Um, and I see a question for Echo. Okay, I'll answer this one. Um, thanks, Brian Bates. Um, has Echo addressed water quality and the public health issues related to water quality? Um, we we ha we have in in a way that um, that's related to public lands. And so one of you know we we look at watersheds and where does our water come from? Um, and so we want to make sure that the public lands that are around those watersheds are, are protected and we don't have, um, you know, um, leaching chemicals or, or um, a spill that goes into our, our watersheds that then go downstream in, in Arizona, you know, coming through the Grand Canyon and going down through the, that pipeline into Phoenix. Um, we want to make sure that the water is is healthy for everybody. But but from a municipal standpoint, we haven't done um, the uh, water quality at the municipal level, but definitely from the larger scale, protecting the watershed from climate change and and wildfire and um, and flooding and um, and you know the how we use the lands through through leasing oil and gas leasing and mining for sure. It occurs to me, based on the questions that are coming in, that maybe for the next one that we do, we ought to set this up more like a, a true panel um, with some other experts. I know I see Sarah Luna's on the line, and the Western Rivers Action Network has done that successfully a few times, where they've had a half a dozen people that are able to field questions of all different kinds. And I, it seems to me like there's some some demand for that, and, and that might serve this audience really well. So we'll take that into consideration for a future event, I think. Camilla, we can talk about that later. That sounds great. Okay. Um, Sandy says wildlife connectivity is a huge issue and even more imperative with the water, with the impacts of climate crisis and sprawling development. Do you think there are ways to fund connectivity overpasses for wildlife and land protections as part of these packages? Yeah, I can. 
probably take that one. Yes, definitely there's going to be money available for that. In fact, it's part of that report. There's a pretty detailed section on wildlife connectivity if you look into that National Wildlife Federation report. Also, it's something that I think is going to be part of the packages. There's a number of different groups that have been talking to different legislators about including the wildlife corridors. And it also fits in with the 30 by 30. It doesn't make sense you know, to just protect areas if it, doesn't, if it doesn't have a strategic benefit to the wildlife. So there's certainly gonna be some areas that provide that connectivity um, for the wildlife that are more important than others and prioritizing those areas is gonna be very important. So I definitely expect that to be part of part of the packages that the details come forward with. Super. Well, that's all the questions that we have. So I'll pass it back to you, Michael. Okay. Well, thank you. And thank you for filling those questions, Camilla and Scott. Um, all right. Well, with that, I'd like to thank our panelists uh, and partners uh, and friends, Scott, Nikki, Camilla, David, uh, for being here today and also obviously for the important work they and their, their organizations do. Uh, I'd like to thank Senator Mark Kelly, who regardless of conflicting schedules, took the time to participate via a recorded message. Um, I'd, offer, I'd like to offer, of course, the Congressman a very special thank you for taking the time to be here in person. Um, he is a very, very busy man. So thank you for that. Um, and then finally, thank you to all of you, our attendees, uh, for joining us today, caring about these issues, engaging in them, and of course, making a difference. That's very important. Um, all of our organization's links can be found in the chat. So if you'd like more information um, or you'd like your quite a little extra effort put into getting your questions answered, we'd be happy to tackle that. So, so please find our organizations in the chat there and don't hesitate to reach out. Thank you all very much for being here today. Thanks, Michael. All right. Thanks, Camilla. Thanks, Nikki. All right. Thank you, everybody. Bye, guys. Bye.